so close to us um, in Next Landing, and the, um, the way they've engaged the community to identify priorities, and um, we're really thankful that the center here uh, has been able to be part of that, and that you um, had a poster at last week's symposium, and that was great. actually <laughs> three, three posters. So, so we're really looking forward to hearing from you today, and maybe we'll have time at the end for a couple questions. Yeah, okay, great. So, um, first off, I'm going to apologize. Alfonso is TA two classes and had to schedule a medical appointment, so unfortunately this was the time that he had to do it. So I'm going to be trying to chan channel some Alfonso energy into this room today, um, but I'm not going to do it justice at all. So that's <laughs> um, So a lot of the questions, any questions about mapping or anything like that, I'll be able to put you in touch with him later on. Um, so I'm Sky Kelsey, and I'm a PhD student in pharmacology and toxicology, mentored by Dr. Van Winkle in the back. And um, my research partner is Alfonso Aranda, who is a Chicano uh, artist, uh, historian, and a geographer. Um, and in the room today, we have three of our promotoras. Um, I have them introduce themselves in a few minutes. Um, together, we make up the research team for the Night Landing Environmental Health Project. And um, my goal for the presentation today is to really overview um, the structure of our project and why, um, why we use community-engaged methods. Um, and then I'm gonna leave a lot of time at the end for the promotors to speak about their experience and for you to ask questions about some of the more details of our methods or some of, some questions for them about their experience working with academic researchers. Uh, so to get started, um, to introduce myself, this is where I'm from. This is Torrance, California. Uh, this is the refinery near my house and this is the explosion that happened right when I started grad school. Um, it is very, it's a huge refinery um, and was a big part of my childhood. I actually got a scholarship from them as a high school student. Um, and this is where I went to school in Houston. You can see that both communities have these flares, both communities have lots of people living in very close proximity to big industries. Um, and my experience growing up and going to school in Houston got me very interested in industrial exposures, especially petrochemical exposures um, and the communities that live right on those fence lines. Um, what my main interest was cancer, so cancer and environmental exposures come hand in hand in these sorts of uh, industrial exposures. Um, Alfonso is actually from Dixon, right down the road from Davis. Uh, he's a child of farm workers, first generation college student. Um, this is his favorite mural. Um, you're not gonna be able to see this, but uh, I'll try to explain the different pieces. So you can see a farm worker, um, uh, carrying some fruit. Um, there's rows along here, and between the rows there's DNA helixes. Within the DNA helixes there are children. Um, this is supposed to represent the impact of agricultural chemicals on multiple generations. So it's not just the women or, or men in the field that are being exposed, but this could potentially um, be transferred onto their offspring through epigenetics. Alfonso's research is really focused on that trans generational exposure effect um, and really like the art behind um, how people understand these exposures within the community. Um, so for both of us, we come together in the field of environmental justice. Um, this field uh, has many definitions. For Alfonso, this means reducing pollution in all communities so that no one faces any toxic exposures. For me, as a toxicologist, I, uh, I have a different definition in which I don't want anyone to be overburdened with pollution in their community relative to other communities. Um, so to do this work, you have to bring together communities, policy members, and academics to really go through um, the whole process of, of understanding exposures and actually creating actions to prevent further exposure um, and overall creating healthier communities. Um, we have three main concepts that uh, our research is really stuck to. So the first one is community-based participatory research. Um, we get to sit at these awesome pro tour meetings, and uh, we think this is the best way to really be accurate about documenting community exposures, and the best way to be effective at creating interventions in communities. Um, so at this point, I'm just gonna have my three pro tours that are in the room just introduce yourself and say maybe why you're, why you're involved in this project. Uh, my name is Lina Hernandez and I live in the community for 32 years and I have health issues but when I met 
Alfonso and Sky that they were so involved in learning about uh, toxicology and all that. What the facts are, I wanted to know for my family and my safety of the community. That's why I got involved. Uh, my name is Paula Felipe. I just came on board with them, so I'm still learning, but I uh, want to learn. It sounds really interesting, and I think something will come out of it. My name is Ruth Perez, and I've been living in Islamic for 17 years. And also been uh, helping this guy since the beginning, and also um, uh, we're very thankful that all of the help that have been giving us and all the information that we've been gathering from them. It's very important. Thank you. Uh, so, how does looks for community research is that we hang out and we Nights Landing 
to existing data about county rates, about the state, and about other similar agricultural communities. Um, next step, molecular epidemiology, which is really linking the biomarkers that we're, we try to measure in the community to disease states, which we can measure through survey tool. Um, and then my favorite is going into the lab and modeling these things in vitro, which is not something that we do with community partners. Um, and then eventually all of these, all this information, we hope to lead, we hope it will lead to action. Um, so based on the results of all these different things and all these different um, data streams, uh, we want that to really give us the most effective action that's gonna be reasonable for the community to accomplish. So uh, I'm gonna start walking through some of the studies that we've done. I'm really gonna be doing this at a quick level so that we can talk about it with our promotoras. Um, so our first, our first study was an environmental health survey. The goal of this was really to address community concerns, to make sure that we were getting good quality data that could be published and compared to existing data sets, and to use our survey data to really be the foundation of our future work uh, in this community. So our first challenge is that Knights Landing is a very small town. The population is about 1,500. Um, our goal was to get 100 people, which is about 10% of the adult population. Our survey, we were able to cut it down to a half an hour, which was a whole process with the promotors that I'm sure they can talk about. Um, and I'm just super proud because our promotors finished this in three weeks. Um, so four of them were able to do 130 minute surveys in a small rural town. We got migrant farm workers, we had homeless folks involved, we had like pretty much right on point with census level demographics at the end of it. So um, their sampling strategy was really cool and super effective to get this data quickly. Uh, some of our main results, um, since this is Western Ag, I'm gonna really be focusing on pesticides. Um, most people live very close to farms. You can see that in the aerial view of Knights Landing, not a surprise. About half the folks in the community use pesticides indoor and outdoor. Um, there's a lot of issues with pests, especially during the harvest season. Um, so yeah, pesticides are important at the household level. Uh, on the, at the workplace, about 25% of our respondents have used pesticides at work. Of that quarter of the population that uses pesticides at work, about a third aren't using protective clothing more than half the time. And about a third, um, or sorry, about a quarter um, aren't changing their clothes after they handle pesticides on the job and before they come home. So there's a big concern about folks being exposed on the job and also a big concern about them bringing that exposure back home with them. Um, some other results from our survey, uh, we are only significantly different result from the county, um, existing county data was that there's about three times higher use of tobacco um, in Knights Landing, sorry, smoking of tobacco in Knights Landing relative to the county. So that's about 20% in Knights Landing and 8% for the county. Um, about 20% of the population is also smoking cannabis. Uh, and there's some overlap between tobacco and cannabis smokers. Um, and additionally, uh, most of the community is drinking bottled water as their main source of drinking water. And that really reflects the fear of c contamination of the public water system and of their private wells. Um, so overall, our results um, for pesticides and for water really mimic what Cal Screen, these big county level and state level monitoring systems are, are documenting as concerns at the state level and at the high scale level. Um, and then smoking was a bit of a surprise. The county isn't very happy with that number. So, uh, so from that data, um, we went into a mapping study. Um, I'm not gonna be presenting focus group or photo voice data today. Uh, that's all Fonso's work and it's still under pro, pro, uh, uh, analysis. So uh, hopefully next time we can share some of those results with you. Instead, I'm just gonna show his uh, mapping work. Uh, let's see. All right, so for our pesticide mapping questions, we wanted to know first off, what is the temporal trend over the different years? How does pesticide application change? Um, and then second, are there hot spots geographically within um, our counties? And then third, is what are the target crops and, and really like how, how are these pesticides being used uh, in Knights Landing? Uh, for our project, since we, we were asked to study cancer by the community, we really focused in on carcinogenic pesticides um, in our work. So uh, 
another great promotora idea was to bring in a comparison community. Um, so Knights Landing is in the red zone, it's an uh, industrial agriculture, conventional agriculture uh, community. Uh, Cape Bay Valley, which is up on the left of the map, is a primarily organic growing region. Very similar to Knights Landing otherwise, other than organic, the difference between organic and uh, conventional agriculture. So for our mapping and most of our pesticide work, we use Cape Bay Valley as a comparison community where we would expect to find less pesticides applied and generally to measure less pesticides in that community. Um, and Cape Bay has been organic for about 30 years. Is that about right? I think about something like that. Like, yeah. Uh, cool. So, so on all the maps, you'll see Cape Bay circled and Nice Landing circled. And if the maps look really ugly, please let me know. We can turn down the lights because Alfonso worked really hard on these. So I want you guys to appreciate them. Um, okay. So this is one tool that's already out there. Um, this is the California Environmental Health Tracking Program. Pretty much just shows pesticide application over the state. Cal and Bioscreen has similar maps. Um, so um, in general, agricultural regions like the Central Valley and some of the growing regions along the coast have higher pesticides than say urban areas or national forests. Um, when we zoom in on that, Cape Bay Valley is here and Nice Landing is there. So Cape Bay, minimal pesticides. Um, nice Landing is part of a much broader growing region where there's higher pesticide application. So that's existing data. Um, what we then did was went in to the raw data. Um, farms in California are required to report their pesticide application. So we went in, we prioritized based on carcinogen status. Um, we used uh, evidence-based uh, scale to really categorize the, the carcinogens, um, and then we threshold them in different communities. So that was a super fun process, and it ended up with this these numbers, so we have 20 carcinogenic pesticides that are used in Cape Bay Valley, 29 that have been used in Nice Landing. Um, overall, they're similar pesticides, um, and they're distributed pretty similarly between our different uh, risk levels for toxicity. Um, so that was, that was how we picked what chemicals to include in our analysis um, for these upcoming graphs. Um, over time, so this is the different years along the x-axis, the total amount of pesticides applied was similar every year for the past five years. Um, the only time that we've seen real big differences in pesticide, the total amount of pesticide applied uh, in a year was during the recession in which there was lower pesticide application. We didn't really see any changes based on the drought years or non-drought years. So overall, it seems to be an economically driven <laughs> number. Um, and in general, Cape Bay Valley has four times less total pesticide and eight times less carcinogenic pesticide applied each year. Um, for the different crops that are targeted, uh, Cape Bay, it's mostly fruits and nuts. Um, nice Landing, a lot of cereals, which would include the rice fields that are around Nice Landing. Um, nice Landing also has a lot more aerial application, which is the blue bar, um, relative to Cape Bay, which is mostly ground application of pesticides. Uh, this is what it looks like over the season. So um, the first peak is the spring planting season. Uh, and then there's a summer, a much larger summer peak. And then it knocks way down for the winter and the fall harvest season. Um, the blue line is nice landing. The green line is actually Cape Bay Valley. So it's much lower levels throughout the year relative to nice landing. Um, the bottom graph shows aerial applications. Aerial applications make, about, make up about 50% of the applied pesticides during the summer in Nice Landing. So um, do you guys want to talk about what, what aerial application looks like in Nice Landing? I, I think it's like a daily. I think you become used to it. I, I don't see during it. the summer, it's 5 in the morning till 7, 8 at night. Mm -hmm. They're and up early. They're up early, and it's like 7 days out of the week. Uh, and so when I did the math on this, it averages out to eight applications in that area a day of crop dusting, like individual crop dusters coming through town or, or the fields around town. So, I mean, it's it's pretty dramatic. What yeah, we have like. uh, three of them, I think, they do, I mean, local around Nice Landing. Sure, yeah, so there's, there's three crop duster crop airports dusters around, the, around Nice Landing. Yeah. yeah. So that contributes to this huge summer peak that's pretty, uh, pretty important when we're thinking about exposures and drift of pesticides. Um, 
All right, so then from the same data set, we wanted to go even smaller geographic scale. So for this graph, Alfonso um, broke it up um, and geocoded the, um, the uh, CalPIP data, which is the reporting data, into 2,000 meter squared squares and looked at the maximum applied in 2,000 meter squares and created um, each of these horizontal lines represents a segment and then color coded those segments. So the red just means that there's much more pesticide applied in that square relative to the lighter color. And here are his fancy graphs, or his fancy maps. So can we see the map changing? No? Okay. So this is point. over a 10 year period. Um, Cape Bay is circled, nice and new circled. Hopefully you can kind of see that the Cape Bay one is green, which means it's not, not very many pesticides applied. Whereas night zoning, you can see this nice like Christmas tree action of red speckles throughout the years. Um, overall, night zoning is consistently higher. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit on night zoning. So you can see around night zoning, it's really surrounded by these red, red hot spots that come up throughout the years. Um, so yeah, indeed night zoning is surrounded. It's, it's not just one field, it's not just one um, area. It's really that whole general growing region, region where the pesticides are being applied every single year at similar levels. Um, then Alfonso did a hotspot analysis, which I really can't explain, but this is a geographical method to look at clustering. Um, so for this analysis, I'm gonna flip through myself. So this is 2005, 2011, and 2015. So in general, you can see between the years, Cape Bay is green and Night's Landing has, is just surrounded by these red spots, although Night's Landing itself is not usually within the red spots. Um, but the Sac River, which is running kind of diagonally through this and goes through Night's Landing, is bringing a lot of the pesticides from those red spot areas through Night's Landing surface water. All right, so that's, those are the cool maps. Um, so the limitations of mapping, um, it all depends on the reporting data. So we're really dependent on, um, yeah, the farmers accurately reporting their data. Um, and it can establish causal, causal relationships. So although we can see that these pesticides are applied differently in these communities, we can't really connect that to any disease states. Um, it's really like just general uh, exposure information and not disease links. Um, so to link exposures to disease, we get into my field, which is toxicology. Um, to, to make that connection, that causation connection, um, we think about not only the exposures, which is a lot of what I've presented so far, we're also thinking about the responses and defenses of individuals that are exposed. Um, so that's like whether they have health care or not, whether they're eating healthy foods, um, all these sorts of things. Um, and then I go into the lab and measure and model um, different exposures and response conditions to see whether things are actually toxic or not. Um, so for this presentation, I'm just gonna focus on the pesticide work. Um, I was able to go out into Cape Bay Valley and Night's Landing during the spring to collect um, household dust and tap water samples. Um, and so far we've only had the spring data analyzed um, and I'm really trying to represent that early peak that we see in the planting season. So um, I'll start off with metals in the water. Um, we found that arsenic, uh, which is on the far left, uh, is pretty close to the MCL maximum contamination limit. So um, that's consistent with the public systems. Um, in general, Yellow County um, and Sutter County have problems with arsenic in the water just based on groundwater deposits. So that's something to keep an eye out on in both the private houses, the private wells that I co collected samples from, and in the public water system. Um, and can you tell them what happened in Robbins next door to y'all with their water? How, the, how they're getting water now? Oh, that uh, they don't even use the water for cooking, drinking, or anything. They bring, uh, I think it's five or six, uh, five gallon to every single house because they don't, they don't want them to use the water at all. Mm -hmm. That's how they do that drinking water and cooking and everything. Yeah, so that's a pretty big problem for a whole town to be facing. Um, mm -hmm. And it's and although Night's Landing is, and Cape Bay Valley are not in violation, we see these these communities around them definitely in violation and some big 
big programs have to be in place to make sure that they have safe drinking water. Um, so yeah, so I was able to help the county by giving them some private well data. Um, for pesticides, um, the moral of the story is that the dust was pretty boring, so I did not find anything. Um, I was only able to really test for like 15 of the 29 carcinogens that we were interested in. Um, the only one that came up positive is bisenferin. We found it in one nice landing home and then in one Cape Bay Valley home below the level of detection. So um, overall, uh, we don't think that pesticides are drifting into homes, um, at least in the springtime. So we're, I'm trying to repeat this for the summer peak and um, trying to take some other non-dust samples that might give us better information about um, active exposures in this community. All right, um, so that's exposure information, which makes up the toxic insult part of my research. Um, the next part of my research is thinking about the body's susceptibility and defense systems. So what I'm then trying to do is take these two things, these two concepts, model it in the lab to look at cellular stress, and then link it to cancer um, in my model systems. So just, I'm gonna give two examples. Um, one is the use of pyperonal butoxide, which is the additive used in pesticides, and naphthalene, which is a solvent that, pesticides, that are used to spray pesticides. Um, you can see that the black bars, naphthalene is toxic, at, and it is more toxic at, at higher doses, whereas uh, when I put in pyperonal butoxide, it's protected at a lower dose, no toxicity, but it is toxic at the higher dose. So there's some sort of interaction between pyperonal butoxide and naphthalene, these two different chemicals, um, where if I just tested naphthalene alone, it's toxic. If I added, some, if I added pyperonal butoxide, it's protected. Um, so these are the sort of mixtures that I'm testing in the lab to see like, if I see arsenic in the water, if I see bifenthrin in the water, how does that play out within um, an actual um, toxicity modeling system? Um, sometimes it reduces toxicity and sometimes they act together to become more toxic. So that's part of my model system. And the other part of my model system is thinking about what sort of tissues to include. Um, I, this is once again, naphthalene exposures. Uh, I use smoker, fatty liver, and then two normal uh, donor pools. Uh, we found high smoking in ice landing, so that's why I chose smoking. Um, and we found 30% uh, of the population with obesity, which is similar to the rest of California, so that's why I chose fatty liver. Um, both of those conditions led to more toxicity um, in my system relative to the normal groups. So that's another aspect that I'm trying to include in my model system, not just what am I exposing them to, what kind of toxic insults are these communities facing, um, but also what kind of defense systems do the, um, do the tissue have in place. So that's gonna be all the lab work I present. Um, and just to sum up some of our data, our, mod, uh, our question is, is night lighting exposed to a disproportionate amount of carcinogens? Thinking about our monitoring data and the existing state level monitoring data, the answer is yes. Thinking about our epidemiology, the answer is yes. Our focus groups and photo voice, which I'm not presenting, say yes. Um, the household sampling that I conducted is sort of inconclusive. We haven't, we don't really have a big enough sample size yet to really make conclusions. Um, and then for the in vitro modeling, that's also in progress, so also inconclusive. Um, and yeah, so overall, like our data is showing that we should be concerned about cancer, we should be concerned about environmental exposures in this community, um, but we're not really sure how bad it is. Um, then, uh, there's a lot of limitations to our work. It's a small sample size. We can talk about a lot of these things later. We have a lot of non-pesticide related projects going on. We can talk about those if you're interested in our discussion period. Um, we think it's really important to share back our results with the community. So we run health festivals to make sure that the community has access to all of our data. Um, and our preparators do an amazing job making sure that the community is updated on all of our new research. We just did a health festival yesterday, so everyone's kind of tired from that effort. Um, and then we also try to go out and do as much academic um, uh, sharing of our research as well. So going to the Western Ag poster session, sending our undergrads to different things um, is a big part of our work. Um, I want to just highlight some of our funding. Western Ag has helped me with the summer stipend, and they helped us do uh, fund our last year's um, health festivals. So that was a big help for us. 
And then these are all the folks that worked on the project. Um, I'm just gonna introduce the promotors that aren't here. Um, so Peggy isn't here, uh, Maida and Melissa, um, but they're a big part of the team too. Um, yeah, so thank you all. And we're gonna just bring the promotors up if you guys have any questions about details of any of these studies, any of our other work, um, or just questions for them about their experience working on this project. All right, thank you. I have a question, Sky, that's yeah. related, I guess, uh, to the pesticide application and the, mm -hmm. the quantity differences. How much of it comes down to rice? Because um, my sense is that rice application, of, you know, pesticide application is yeah. aerial. You said that there's a lot of rice in that area, mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm not aware of it being grown in Cafe Valley. Yeah, so I would say um, from for the biggest contributors to the pesticide, it's definitely the, the aerial is huge. Aerial is mostly rice and trees. So it's um, it's both the trees, like fruit and nut trees and rice that, um, that are big concerns. And as I'm sure many folks know, we're really transitioning to a lot more trees. Uh, like in the past few years, there's just a lot more trees going in and less vegetables. So we're, we're expecting this number just to even keep going up further as we do more aerial application. It's a little bit less efficient, right, to get the actual pesticide to the pest when you're doing it from a plane versus when you're directly applying from the ground. So, yeah. So I would say rice and trees, those are our big concerns. Yeah. Especially for the rice. Yeah, the, the rice. Main thing. Yeah. And, and the actually, trees, like you said, you know, even if they do it with the tractors, you go by and you can see it or you can smell it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when they do it with the little tractors, you can still see it and smell it. Definitely. Yeah. And I think, um, a big part of that too is that I mean different pesticides are used for different things. So, um, so yeah, that doesn't really take into account the toxicity of the chemicals that are being applied that way. Um, yeah, which is like analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any early thoughts on some of the policy actions you may take uh, with this data? Yeah. So um, I'm gonna. So we're working with local health agencies. So that's really our main point of contact. Um, and then I honestly think that we're gonna be more effective working directly with farmers than doing any policy changes. Um, so one thing that we're really trying to do right now is bring more UC Davis extension folks and ag researchers to have field flights in Knights Landing um, to try to bring some of the new like IPM ideas and materials out into this community um, and really trying to make that connection so that these local farmers, and most of the farmers live in the community, so they're really interested in not being poisoned and not having their families poisoned too. So. Yeah, so I think that's going to be our more effective strategy. Um, yeah, I don't think our sample size is going to be big enough for any policy changes at this point. And honestly, most of what we're finding is not a surprise. It's just helping us to prioritize what actions to take first. Um, I think that if we get funded, like a lot more funding, and we can stay and be professors forever and do this research with us, have our former promotors forever, then um, do, we would want to include more communities. So we really want to have a stronger stand in Cape Bay, we really want to include other, some of maybe some of those hotspot communities that are popping up in our sampling, in our monitoring, and then I think once we get that bigger population size, we can start to actually have data that is a little bit more policy oriented or useful for policy. Yeah. But even, you know, so far with the, what you're teaching us and what we're teaching the uh, community, at least, you know, they know we have to change before we get home, we have to do this. There's, you know, a lot of education to go on that people don't know that we can, you know, start teaching them or change your clothes before you go to your house. Yeah. You know, change, wash your hands, do a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff that people don't know that yeah. we don't even know. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> this is, it's a big deal. Yeah, and I think that's like bringing Western Ag educators and stuff out there and getting that connection a little stronger as well too. Yeah, that's actually, that my mind went there as well. The number of people who aren't changing before going home um, that's a teachable moment. And so I'm curious to you, uh, we, we at the center are trying to develop more materials and more resources for people in communities. Um, we don't always know the best way of doing that though. So I'm curious as promotoras, how do you share information? What are, is, are you giving people information? How are you transmitting the, the resources and the knowledge that you get from working with Sky to your community members? Uh, we pass flyers so we flyers. talk to them you know you start talking to one person that person talk to another person and then they come and ask you questions 
well, this is what's going on, this is what we do, this is what you should be doing for your own good, for your own family. We have seven, eight cases of uh, breast cancer, yeah. we have cases of skin cancer, and a lot has to do with the sun, people don't know how to protect themselves, so, you know, a little bit it helps. When one person asks one question, the other person talks about it, and they're kind of curious, and they come and say, well, what, you know, what's going on, or what do we do, what's the best thing we can do to protect ourselves. Are there things that you wish you had information about on the on the health and safety agriculturally related topics that you just don't have the information um, or the resources that a group like ours could contribute to? Well, for me, I didn't work out in the fields, but my family, I'm pretty sure they would appreciate it if people years ago would say, you know, protect yourself, yeah. use sunscreen, put a hat. Before it was like, we don't care, we just go to work and we come home. Mm -hmm. You know, with the um, uh, Pesticide yeah, yeah. Um, people didn't know. Like I said, they come home, they hug your kid, you know, you hug your kid, you then change your clothes, you don't wash your hands, things like we didn't know about it. People didn't know about it. So now that you know everything's coming out and they're taking more precaution to go home, wash their hands, remove their clothes. Farmers didn't even care, but like this guy said, they're all local farmers. Yeah. So now they're interested in it too. Okay, we need to do this, we need to do that to protect our workers and his family, their families. Because they're our neighbors. They yeah. live right next to yeah. us or something. So there are, you know, I think once they start, um, the people are gonna be opening more and maybe they'll be willing to share the information or to be right next to us trying to change, not the policies, but Action, uh, yeah. what the auctions and that every day, you know, maybe talk to their workers a little more, you know, because sometimes, a lot of times they'll, right before uh, the season starts and they'll go sign, but I see it myself, they're, they'll go sign, but do they really read it? Do they really take that thing home and they're going to do what the, the flyer said? I think word of mouth is a lot more than doing a really quick sign and, and the actions that they take at the fields. And we can see it and we can hear they're having more meetings, more training than before they didn't have. Now they're training them and uh, first aid, they're training and you know, everything. So it's, it's working, it's, you know, something's coming out of it. I feel so fortunate to have you here. I could keep yeah. going. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So yeah. yeah you guys learn and we learn from you guys. <laughs> exactly. First, I apologize of my English, but I'd like to say something because uh, uh, two months ago I was the uh, general manager of the uh, agriculture division of a sugar company in Hetanol in Brazil. And this, this kind of questions, that's why I came here. Uh, yeah. I'm unemployed at the moment. I just came here today to study improve my English because most of the companies, especially the international ones, are requiring a better English. Sure. But I'm interested in that, this kind of question. So this, this talk became so serious in Brazil, and 11 years ago, they created a special rule for this kind of problem. For example, in the, most of farms and sugar and ethanol, even the big farm, they have to to have a special bathroom in the farm. At the end of the day, the worker had to go to that bathroom, uh, take a shower, left their clothes. It's dirt of the farmer to, to, uh, to deal with the clothes, dirt clothes. And even the bathroom has uh, the, the water had to pass through a, a, like a, treatment. Like a sand a treatment. Sure, sure. Uh, we are having some big problems with this, but in the last 10 years, it seems uh, getting better, much better than in the past. And I would ask you, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, especially in potato crops, mm -hmm. I'm agronomist by my, my major, initial major. Yeah. Uh, potato crops, tomato crops, uh, tobacco, yeah. uh, Despite the the size of uh, simple, did you think about to search about suicide? Because in Brazil, in some areas, especially in the salt, in the areas when they cultivate tobacco, mm. or maybe near the areas with potato, they 
the rate of suicide is higher than the, the normal rate in yeah. the whole population. Yeah. It's related to the death side. Yeah, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, so our, our project does have a mental health theme right now. That was something that the Pomodoro has really brought to the table as a, as a concern in the community. We have not looked at suicide. We have looked at um, depression and anxiety. We're still sort of preliminary on that. We are seeing um, depression and anxiety at fairly high levels. I can say that in both the white and the Mexican community that's in nice landing, and we're seeing it um, in both female and male. So, so, so far, it has been, it has been a concern. Um, for, for my research, I'm really linking that to self-medication, and especially right now, smoking, tobacco, and cannabis is really where I'm going with that. Um, yeah, we have not looked at self-harm or suicide. Uh, we also haven't had the capacity to do any dementia or Alzheimer's, any of, any of that sort of stuff. Um, that's something that we're interested in expanding into as we get, if we are able to build more capacity. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a huge concern. Because um, I know in America, it's also it's also true that the suicide rate is, is fairly high in rural and especially agricultural communities. So it's a big concern. Yeah. No, normally, uh, depression and anxiety is related to the, the family of pesticides called neonicotinoids. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, this, this special family. Uh, the big companies don't like to really talk about that, but yeah. they, they, they invest a big amount of money to avoid specials, especially in developing countries. But uh, new nicotinoids is on the, have been much discussed. Thank you for your answer. Yeah, yeah. What do you think the reason is for this higher increase of smoking that you're finding? I was surprised. <laughs> I'm not going to answer that, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've got my theories, but what do you guys think? So why do you think folks smoke in your community? There's because nothing to do a lot of the things. <laughs> you know, I, I believe there's not, we don't have a programs to, for soccer, for sports, you know, that some of the parents could afford it and they have to come all the way to Wyndham Davis, but I believe, um, that's what I believe, but it could be something different. There's not a lot of things in the summer for the kids to do, so they end up doing what they're not supposed to do. Yeah. And there's a lot of times the teens are taking care of themselves. The older 16 have to be taking care of the siblings. You know, mom and dad go to work seven days a week, 12 hours a day. There's not a lot of supervision around and not a lot of them things to do, so they end up, I think, smoking. And the grown-ups, I think, it's because the depression does the way to, I think, guess to make them feel better. Because I talked to some people that said, well, that's how I keep my anxiety out. If yeah, it, I'll go in and smoke. Yeah. And you know, there's, there's other ways to do it, but like she said, there's nothing in Night Landing. So that's the easy way. I go to the store, buy me a pack of cigarettes, and just do it. It would be interesting to look at some of the other studies that have been done with the center and um, in similar agricultural communities um, with similar demographics to see if, if because that stood out to me. I, I think yeah, that it is higher. Yeah, and we have a bunch of qualitative than, work and survey work going on yeah. right now, and even including occupational smoking rules. That's another thing we're finding right. is that the um, the rules of like whether folks can smoke out in the field. It's very different than like in Davis where we can't even smoke on campus at all. Anything yeah. so. Um, so it's, we're we're really we have some qualitative work going on ongoing right now yeah. on that project. Yeah. And that's what we we were doing the uh, the surveys. A lot of people when we ask them, can you smoke anywhere? And there was oh yeah, I work. You know, on their break, not while they're working, yeah. but you know they're out in the field. So whatever the break, they could just get a cigarette and start smoking instead of eating something healthy. they will be smoking, yeah. and they come home and they do the same thing. There's a lot of single male workers that come um, migrant so that they smoke a lot yeah. are there h2a workers do you know if there's contract workers who are coming in from mexico just for seasons at a time or are most of the people those are hard i don't see a lot of no. them okay i think i think most most of the folks that we've surveyed live in nice yeah. year round and there is the there is a migrant and there are some families that migrate as well, but overwhelming majority of folks in nice meetings. Yeah. But not with the visa, the age, something. That yeah. I don't see a lot of those. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. 
Any other questions? <laughs> well, Sky, thank you so much yeah, for taking the time and leaving your conference to be with us. Yeah. We appreciate it. And um, we definitely would be interested in follow up, you know, in another year or so when you had a chance to look at even more of your data and talk to the community more. We would love to hear about it. Yeah.